Thank you, Adrian. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. We have a few participants in America, a few participants in Europe. Um, I'm the director of the European Studies Center, and it's a special day. Um, those who are in Washington know it's a new dawn, and we also feel in Europe it's a new dawn um, with new relations. And if people have looked at um, statements on both sides of the Atlantic, both have emphasized that this is a moment of new multilateral cooperation and at the heart of the cooperation is the topic that we are discussing today, the environment, a new green deal, um, the COP26 and so on. So I'm particularly proud, not only that we have such a high level conference, but it's also the timing is ideal because it couldn't be better just the day before hope um, returned to those kind of issues. So the European Studies Center for those of you who don't know, because I understand for about, about at least 150 people are joining us today and more and more coming in, but we have about 150 now. The European Studies Center at St. Anthony's College studies Europe from a historical, legal, political, and economic point of view. And UPEP, um, the program or the project on European political economy is a continuation of a program that we had before, which focused on mainly financial markets and central banks. And we are quite happy that the new team led by Charles, by Adrienne, by Julie, by Daniel and by others have broadened the scope of the program and the environment and all its implications for society, for economics, for politics and so on is at the heart of this particular conference. And as you can imagine, um, everyone who's interested in European politics is interested nowadays in the environment. I personally um, had a long interest in the environment in Europe. I wrote one of my theses, a master's thesis in America on the role of the European Union in environmental diplomacy in the preparation for UNSET. And what comes over and over again is a European ambition which is not 100% fulfilled by reality. And at the beginning of a year where um, climate change, COPE and so on, is on the agenda, again, this is an opportunity to think about European ambitions, but not only ambitions of the European Commission, but ambitions of all stakeholders in European society, be it policymakers, but also business, um, finance, we have participants from the investment community, but first and foremost, it will affect all of us as citizens of Europe and as citizens of the world. And I think we have excellent four panels um, that will reflect on that. First of all, we'll get an overview on what the European Union um, plans to do. Then we have an investment perspective, we have an analysis of the Glasgow meeting, and then we have a panel on, and I think that's very, very important, on activism and on people actually committing to this agenda, because if you don't have the grassroots support for the necessary changes that we all are looking for, then the project will fail. Um, before we go into that, I have to thank a few people, and I'm very, very happy to do so. I mentioned um, the organizers, Adrienne in particular, but her team, Julie, Jess, Charles, Daniel, all the teams um, related to the European Studies Center have put over the months a lot of work into this. We have cooperation partners. Um, we have representatives of the Blavatnik School, the Martin School, but also um, foundations, the European Commission, investors, academics, they all contribute. And I think we value in our center those kind of cooperations and we are really keen on bridging intellectual thinking with policy making and practitioners who implement um, what we have in mind. So we have an exceptional panel and thanks to those who have made that possible. There's a cooperation with the Europeum. The Europeum is a network of 18 leading universities. And I would like to thank the director, Marcin Valetsky for his contribution to the program. And I know um, Adrienne and Marcin had a lot of discussions in the background how to organize this conference. So um, I can only say we have thanked the one who is at the heart of it, 
and Adrienne um, will lead us to um, the program, but also might have some administrative comments um, how, how we want to organize it. So let me finish by thanking all of you again, and I'm really excited. This is a wonderful conference, is one of the highlights of our center this year, and I'm looking forward to a stimulating afternoon. Adrienne. Thank you, Hartmut. Hi, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today for what promises to be a fascinating conference. My role in this is to give you an overview for a couple of minutes on what the conference is about, why it's constructed the way it is, and to give you a couple of rules on Zoom behavior, which is a whole new science, at least to me. So as Hartmut said, the conference is about the political economy challenges of actually delivering the massive economic and social transformation of the planet that we're going to need in order to contain climate change successfully. We have four sessions. The first is on the international climate negotiations. Since Britain is hosting COP26, the next climate summit in Glasgow in November, it's a good time to scrutinize how these negotiations are actually working. And in particular, whether they're fit for purpose for delivering the outcome that the planet needs. The European Green Deal is the EU's contribution to these climate negotiations. And indeed, its announcement a year ago sent a powerful challenge to the rest of the world to be at least as ambitious in their commitments to climate action. I, I know that in fact, we're going to spend the next decade complaining about the difficulties in implementing the Green Deal. But speaking as an Irish person, I have to say that I'm very proud of the leadership role that Europe is playing in all of this. And I'm looking forward to the discussion in the first session on how to build on this for the COP and beyond the COP. The second and third sessions are on how we're actually going to pay for the Green Deal and for climate action. The second session is on governments and the third session is on the financial sector. And for both governments and the financial sector, facing such a huge financial challenge is posing difficult questions that will need to be addressed. In Europe in particular, it's hard to see how governments will be able to foot the bill given their current indebted starting point and the constraints of the European fiscal framework. Economists are very quick to suggest that carbon taxes are the answer, but the protests of the Gilets Jaunes were a clear demonstration of how difficult it's actually going to be to make higher carbon prices socially acceptable. So there is a huge analytical and policy agenda under these headings of government's role in managing to pay for climate change. And then there's the question of how best to mobilize financing for the large investment needs, both in the official financing sector and in the private sector. And in, in this, given that the challenge is so large, there's a third dimension to it, which is whether and how even central banks may uh, contribute to supporting financing for climate change. The question is how could this be come about? And the final session confronts an even more difficult challenge. The rise of public activism has been a strength of the climate movement, but the question is, the interests are so diverse, how to harness these very many different interests so that together they play a coherent and effective role in achieving, in achieving climate targets. Okay, on to administrative arrangements. Each session will last an hour. This is a bit shorter than for in-person conferences because we're conscious of the limits, the tolerance of people to sit through Zoom meetings. Between sessions, we'll have breaks of 15 minutes. And if you're taking a break, leave your Zoom link open to come back to the same link. We'll be asking chairs to be strict in enforcing the time limits, not only so that the audience can stretch their legs, but also because we'll need the time to switch videos from the outgoing to the incoming panels. For the discussions, I'm afraid it would be impractical to have oral interventions from the audience. 
So we're asking the audience to please submit questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then the chair will pass the questions on your behalf to the participants. And I apologize in advance if the chairs don't get to all of the questions. So let me finish by thanking the panelists for making this wonderful conference possible and for tolerating all my emails about the Zoom arrangements. The lineup is amazingly impressive and brilliant. And so I look forward to a wonderful afternoon. Let me hand over to Tom to start the first session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian, and welcome everyone. To, and thank you again for joining us. My name is Thomas Hale. I'm an associate professor at the Bovatic School and a fellow at St. Anthony's College here in Oxford. Um, and we're delighted to begin kicking off this conference with a panel focusing on a question that's even more salient this morning and this afternoon than it has been in the past. The role of Europe and COP26, contribution and expectations. We have three fantastic speakers. I'll introduce each one sequentially following the order in the program and ask them to speak for a maximum of 15 minutes. And speakers, um, I'm afraid I will sheepishly interrupt and come in at the 15 minute mark. So apologies in advance for that, but we do um, want to set a great model in our first panel of timekeeping for the rest of the conference. Um, but that will be good because it'll give us time for questions and discussion. And so please be entering your questions audience into the question and answer function as Adrian described. Um, today is of course an interesting new day to be thinking about this question given the change of administration in Washington. And I happen to notice that there's actually this afternoon scheduled a call between the executive vice president for the Green Deal, Mr. Franz Timmerman and President Joe Biden's new special presidential envoy for climate change, Secretary John Kerry. So I think a question on everyone's mind and a question I'm sure for our first speaker is, what is Europe asking Mr. Kerry this afternoon? And what is it offering? What is this relationship going to look like going forward? And how does that look in COP26? Our first speaker is the Director General of DG Klima, Mr. Mauro Patriccione. Mauro is a longstanding member of the European Commission, previously serving as Deputy Director of DG Trade. So he's seen these kinds of issues from a variety of perspectives over the years. Mr. Director General, over to you, please. Thank you, Tom. I'll, um, I apologize in advance if I will go very fast through certain things, but uh, um, you have asked a big question um, and I'll try to, to, um, to give something useful to the audience to, uh, to discuss. I mean, first, the Green Deal has been mentioned and our, as our contribution to uh, the COP process. Now, our Green Deal is, is a tool. Our objective is climate neutrality in 2050. More than that, you know, Europe being climate neutral by 2050 may be morally satisfying. Uh, it's not going to fix climate change. So our ambition for 2050 is not only to do our part, but to demonstrate that climate neutrality, net zero greenhouse gas emission is possible. And it's possible in a context where you are transforming your economy on a permanent basis. Modernize it, make it competitive, um, make it clean and driving towards a prosperous society. Uh, the Gilets Jaunes has been mentioned as well already. If you ask people to choose, as uh, one of the demonstrators did once showing a, um, a sign to, the, to a camera, if you ask people to choose between the end of the world and the end of the month, they'll worry first about the end of the month. Now, our job is not to give our people that choice. Our job is to transform our economy in depth, uh, but in a way that's permanent, it's stable, it's prosperous, it's viable. And we do think that we can do that. Uh, and if we don't do that, we will not be able to persuade anybody else to follow. And if we don't persuade anybody else to follow, then we are all literally cooked uh, because that's where climate change, change is driving us. The, the Green Deal is a tool. It's the first step of a 30 year trajectory that builds on what we've done so far, and but puts in a completely different perspective, which is that of a planetary transformation in the second half of that century. And to close the loop with the COPs, that's exactly what the Paris Agreement is about. Paris Agreement is about transforming our society in depth, transforming our economy in a way that leads us to net zero across the world as soon as possible after 2050, and into negative emissions afterwards to try and restore the world that we've already lost. And make no mistake, 
a 1.5 degrees world isn't pretty. It's much worse than what we have now, and it will require an enormous effort in, in, in adaptation. Now, COP26 uh, is our occasion to put finally the COP process on the real path to the Paris goals. Uh, the COPs after Paris have started, first of all, with the, uh, with the relief that we finally had that agreement of so many failures. Then with the necessary logistical work of say, okay, we have these goals, we have this machine, this agreement, how do we make it work? The rule book that was agreed in, in, in Katowice, uh, which we almost completed in Madrid and failed to do so, um, the transparency, the, the methodology, the ability of people to work together. But the risk that we see now is a bit of a disconnect between what many parties, especially the big emitters, are actually doing at home and uh, what they discuss, what they talk about uh, in the COPs. If you look at the past few months, you have a flourishing of long-term objectives. Finally, the Paris Agreement foresaw that we should all present long-term strategy in spring 2020. Uh, we haven't got all of them, but we have a, a growing number of them and a growing number of objectives which fit with the, uh, with the goal of the Paris Agreement. Uh, we were the first. We made a proposal in December 2018. Our member states endorsed it in December 2019, and we tabled it in, in the, under the Paris Agreement in the spring last year. But in, um, uh, in the autumn, we've seen China with carbon neutrality in 2060. We've seen Japan confirming their strategy goes to climate neutrality in the same way as Europe by 2050. We've seen Canada tabling a climate law. We've seen Korea making announcement. And we heard the, can the then candidate, uh, Joe Biden, saying that that ought to be the message of the, the goal of the United States. Um, now, with what uh, Antonio Guterres has uh, started calling a net zero coalition, uh, you see the beginning of that movement that I was describing earlier was climate neutrality. Now, countries need a plan, need a strategy, need investment, need resources. That's what we are trying to put together with the Green Deal, is the front loading of the investment we need, it's front loading of the regulatory tool we need, and it's the establishment of a bell, smooth, predictable trajectory between now and 2050. Make no mistakes, for Europe, this is a gigantic transformation. We've never planned economic policy at the 30 years horizon. Um, the communist countries have tried and not necessarily made the great uh, outcome of that, even though in China plans do seem to have some, some effect. Uh, but 30 years, um, yet 30 years in terms of the investment that we need to make is, is a very short time span. How do we bring this spirit, this concrete spirit to the COP and avoid getting entangled again in a minute negotiation about uh, uh, the weight of this notification uh, obligation, uh, whether or not uh, we should spend money on adapting to the inevitable climate change, or whether there should be a responsibility for the loss and damage suffered by the more vulnerable countries, uh, and who is historically responsible for the world we live in. Not that that doesn't matter. But that doesn't fix the problem. That debate does not achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. The debate on national determined contribution, what can country do, who helps them do so, with what resources, um, what are our common goals and how we translate them in domestic policy making and in international cooperation, that's what makes uh, Paris real. Now, going towards Glasgow, uh, we see a variety of avenues where we need to innovate. We need to talk more about adaptation. That debate started already in Madrid. It was tentative. Um, adaptation is important for all of us and absolutely essential for the more vulnerable countries who are really at risk. Some of them are disappearing literally. And uh, we have been worried that Working on adaptation would detract attention from mitigation. We'd be worried about the more hazard of that, but it's time to stop. Adaptation and mitigation are two facets of the same, of the same medal, and we must deal with both of them at the same time. 
climate finance is finally coming to a head. Um, but we have to get out of the uh, false dichotomy. And you know, climate finance is about financing things that uh, shouldn't happen otherwise. No, uh, climate finance is financing what we want to finance, which is economic growth, job creation, uh, education, health, in a way that's compatible with our planetary goals uh, for climate change. It's not a question of doing more things and finding more money for them. It's a question of doing what we have to do differently and still finding money for, uh, for that. Um, we are moving slowly into that mentality in Europe. We're not 100% there either. Uh, but I think that is the real conversation we need to have in, in, in Madrid. Uh, under the technical guise of the post-2020 goal, the post-2025 goal, et cetera, et cetera. But that is the, the, the crux of the matter. Um, and there is an issue of credibility of the uh, big emitter, the developed countries, the emerging economies, those who with, with greater resources. Uh, and that credibility uh, is played out not only in terms of how much we help our uh, more vulnerable partners and, and less well-equipped partners to cope with climate change, uh, but it started by demonstrating the solidarity uh, cuts across anything that's important. Solidarity in vaccines um, seem, seemingly has nothing to do with climate change, but if we don't show solidarity in this health crisis, how can we be believed when we say that we will show solidarity in, fight, in fighting climate change? And make no mistake, when we finally start talking about recovery, the question of debt relief will re-emerge in the same spirit because the situation was already bad before uh, with the situation that we'll find when we finally uh, put our nose out of our houses again uh, when this pandemic recedes, uh, the question of debt relief will be uh, even more dramatic. Uh, and again, it will be a question of credibility for uh, developed nations and for international institutions uh, to be believed when we talk about something which is even more difficult and even more long term, like uh, stopping climate change and, and eventually uh, uh, reversing it. We will have also a number of initiatives uh, put forward by the, uh, the British presidency, which are aimed at also bridging the gap between the international negotiation and the closed world of international negotiators. And that I know something about that because I've lived in this kind of world for the past 33 years um, in different areas, but international negotiators all the same. Um, and uh, the real world of domestic policy making, of international cooperation and solidarity. I'll quote just one, which I think is uh, probably one of the most important, uh, and this is the one about uh, can we finally stop financing new coal fire, uh, coal fire power? Uh, we know that eliminating what exists is a necessity, it's not easy, it will have to be handled. There is a whole issue about just transition uh, and the timing and the resources for it. Uh, can, can we at least stop digging a hole in which we are already up to our neck? Uh, can our British friends put together a credible initiative we can all join for? I think that would be one of the most uh, successful elements of this COP if, if that was possible. Um, I'll stop here, I mean, I think I, I, one could go on for a while, but let me just say one thing to the point that the, the, the Hartmann Meyer made, made earlier on, when he was talking about uh, ambition and reality. Of course, our ambitions aren't reality yet. If they were reality, it would be no longer ambitions. Ambition is something you don't have and you want. The real question is, are we equipping ourselves to achieve those ambitions and make them into reality. And I think I can say with, uh, with a straight face that Europe is equipping itself. There's plenty of risks, plenty of uncertainties. Uh, only madmen would guarantee success, but we are equipping ourselves. Uh, and I think we can be confident that uh, uh, they will manage. Now, can we do so in a way that's credible, that's replicable, that people are interested and willing to replicate because they think it's to their advantage. Can we offer the working model of a climate neutral society, which is also modern, technologically advanced and prosperous to all our partners developed and developing alike? I think that's the biggest challenge 
and it's even bigger than succeeding only in Europe. If we succeed in Europe on something the rest of the world does not find interesting, well, yes, we may be a bit better off in Europe, but in the end, climate change will catch up with us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Director General. I think you put the challenge very well as how does this Green Deal, this tool you mentioned, how does that become a tool not just for Europe's transition, but also a tool of influence around the world and to create a real solution which will require reaching far beyond Europe's borders, of course, to, toward a global transformation. I'm sure we'll want to come back to that in the question and answer period. Um, before you open up the floor, let me come to our other speakers. Our next one is uh, someone who knows a lot about COPs. Um, Mr. Emmanuel Germain is the executive director for the international group at the, at the European Climate Foundation. And before that, he served as special advisor to the French climate ambassador, Rance Tubiana, and was critical and really um, one of the people most on the ground, in the room, with the pen, whatever metaphor you prefer around the 2015 Paris Agreement. And since then, Emmanuel has been at the forefront of global efforts to bring political consensus forward through track two, track 1.5 type processes. So he's been thinking about what COP26 can and should and must do, and also what its limitations might be, probably more than, than almost anyone else on the planet. Um, Emmanuel, your reflections, please. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, and thank you very much, um, Adrian, for uh, the very kind um, invitation to join you uh, today. It's a special day, um, indeed. Um, and I'd like to say, uh, before I start, uh, thank you very much to um, Oxford University in general um, and several of its schools um, in particular, uh, like yours, for uh, your relentless um, efforts in pushing the uh, climate agenda forward. Um, very much um, appreciated. Um, so let me um, indeed uh, respond to your invitation to um, outline uh, briefly um, what are uh, some of the key criteria for uh, success um, at COP26 in Glasgow um, at the end of the year. Um, and uh, how we might approach uh, delivering um, on those objectives. Um, and given who is um, organizing uh, this uh, conference and who is uh, joining, let me uh, try and blend uh, a few theoretical uh, concepts uh, with uh, real life um, experience um, of negotiating um, uh, climate change. Um, I'd like to um, outline briefly four um, key objectives uh, for uh, COP26 um, and see um, how uh, they complement uh, each other. Um, the first um, and very much building um, on what Maro uh, just outlined um, is the importance of setting um, a clear long-term goal uh, for net zero greenhouse gases emissions uh, economy-wide by um, sometime uh, during the second half of the century, um, and indeed in particular for the OECD countries, but in fact for all countries uh, by uh, 2050. Um, it's extremely important uh, to set um, such a clear vision um, and such a precise um, goal um, because uh, part of the um, uh, usefulness um, of global um, agreements um, in this space to uh, accelerate um, uh, global climate action and make sure uh, that um, the um, international action um, adds up to more uh, than the sum of its parts um, is to uh, shape expectations uh, by all stakeholders um, uh, in the uh, global economy, um, in particular investors, um, as you will discuss um, in other uh, panels, uh, to shape expectations uh, because uh, it helps to uh, create uh, some kind of self-fulfilling uh, prophecies um, and make sure uh, that the um, investments uh, that are made um, in the global economy uh, progressively, um, and in fact, in some cases, pretty quickly, uh, result um, in the price um, of uh, low or zero carbon technology or solutions uh, becoming cheaper uh, than their um, high carbon uh, alternatives. Um, as Mauro uh, pointed out, um, the uh, Paris Agreement adopted in 2015 
um, already provided uh, such a clear uh, objective for uh, the world uh, together. Um, it also invited um, individual countries um, and other uh, non-state actors uh, to submit um, an individual uh, development strategy uh, that um, integrates uh, this uh, objective of reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we are now, um, and in particular, um, in the wake of, as Mauro uh, said, uh, Europe uh, taking the lead, uh, China very importantly uh, following through uh, with a decisive uh, commitment to uh, reach uh, that very same objective by 2060, uh, which um, already produced um, domino effects uh, in other countries, in particular in the region with uh, Japan and South Korea um, in turn uh, following suits um, and with uh, today the uh, US uh, uh, rejoining the Paris Agreement um, and with that commitment to achieve zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, um, as well as, and I'll say a few more words uh, about that, uh, reaching uh, um, uh, zero carbon emissions um, in the power sector uh, by uh, 2035. Um, we are creating uh, that momentum uh, that makes um, um, hopefully inevitable, uh, the fact that the long-term horizon uh, for climate action um, is indeed um, uh, zero greenhouse gases emissions. Um, and as Mauro uh, said, and as the uh, UN Secretary General um, um, outlined, um, it is one of the key objectives um, of COP26 uh, that there is the largest possible number of countries, uh, but also businesses, investors, uh, cities and regions uh, that take uh, such um, a commitment for uh, economy-wide uh, zero greenhouse gases emission, um, because that provides uh, the type of self-fulfilling prophecies um, in investments uh, that I talked about. The second point I'd like to outline um, is that, of course, setting a long-term target um, is not sufficient. Um, I would strongly argue, um, unlike um, what uh, some people um, 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 argue, uh, that um, it is not meaningless, in particular, by the way, in a country like China, uh, where for um, everybody who knows um, about China, uh, bureaucracy is very much politics and taking uh, such a commitment translates um, into the system and in particular in five-year uh, plans. Uh, but you absolutely um, need to uh, back it up with uh, short-term commitments to either 2025 or 2030 that are in line with that long-term objective. And it is indeed in those uh, short-term commitments uh, that the proof is in the pudding. Um, and we're not there yet. Uh, we're absolutely not there yet. Um, it, is, it is true. Uh, that the nationally determined contributions that were made um, in Paris were uh, widely insufficient uh, to put us on the right trajectory to maintain uh, the rise in average uh, global temperature to well below two degrees Celsius, um, hopefully um, aiming for uh, 1.5. Um, and this is why, and that's uh, the second uh, theoretical um, element, if you will, uh, that translates into practice at Glasgow at the end of the year. This is why we included such a ratchet mechanism uh, to make sure uh, that each and every country uh, not only revises, um, it's not, it's not um, an optical uh, revision that we are in need uh, for. It's a very significant increase um, in those commitments by 2025 or 2030. Uh, that we need so that um, uh, we get as close as possible, um, of course, without thinking uh, that we're going to be able to close that gap entirely by the time of Glasgow, uh, but we need to make uh, sufficient progress uh, to be on track towards reducing global greenhouse gases emissions by half uh, by 2030. This is what science uh, roughly uh, tells us without dictating, by the way, the ways in which uh, individual countries or sectors or companies uh, can do that, which is the bottom up nature of the, um, of the agreement. But this is why um, um, uh, COP26 is so important 
um, and why uh, we need to watch uh, not just the uh, long-term commitments to uh, 2050 or beyond uh, that will be made, uh, but I would argue that the, uh, the proof of success um, in the credibility um, of the international agreement is also going to be in the revision um, of the uh, 2030 uh, targets uh, that were uh, made. And we're, um, you know, in a decent shape, uh, but um, we're, we're certainly not there yet. Um, Europe uh, took an important step uh, forward um, and in many, in many ways um, uh, took the lead. Um, it needs to be joined uh, by um, others in making such um, um, a significant um, enhancement um, in its commitment. The third point I'd like to make um, is that um, in Paris, part of the um, innovation in global governance, if you will, uh, was precisely to design the international agreement as uh, something way more uh, than just the traditional uh, state to state or government to government um, agreement um, and to put at the very center um, of the agreement uh, the non-state actors and the jargon of these uh, negotiations and that is um, as I already mentioned the businesses the investors uh, the cities, uh, the regions, and other uh, local um, uh, authorities. Here, what's particularly important, um, and I must say that I'm very pleased to see uh, that the British presidency of COP26 is putting a clear emphasis on that, um, is also to make sure that you're not talking only about um, economy-wide uh, targets, uh, but that you are specific um, about the implications sector by sector um, of reaching those economy-wide targets. Uh, there are a few no-brainers um, about uh, what we've got to do uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, Mauro started to outline um, a few. Um, of course, phasing out coal um, is probably the most obvious of those. Uh, the call to clean um, energy transition, not just in the power sector, but in the energy sector um, at large, uh, raising important questions uh, that I'm sure, um, or at least I hope, will be part of the discussion in between our friends um, at the European Commission um, and Mr. Uh, John Kerry um, is the issue of gas um, as well um, and uh, the larger uh, energy transition. The same is true, by the way, in the transportation uh, sector um, and the uh, much needed um, end of the um, internal uh, combustion engine to be replaced uh, by um, electric cars. Uh, the same is true um, in the land use uh, sector, um, agriculture, forestry. Um, I think roughly speaking, um, it's true to say that the, uh, the first wave of nationally determined contributions as well as commitments uh, by um, businesses and investors uh, mainly addressed the um, energy related uh, carbon emissions um, and there is a clear need for other sectors such as, as I said, uh, land use but also um, industry uh, to be uh, much further um, integrated in that second wave um, of commitments that will be made um, at COP26. Um, to conclude, uh, let me outline the force uh, criteria for uh, success, uh, which was um, already identified unsurprisingly by uh, Mauro, um, and that is on finance. Um, and finance is an absolutely essential uh, component um, of success um, at COP26. Um, very important to consider uh, that in those negotiations, um, ambition um, and equity um, are literally the two sides um, of the same coin um, and that there are different ways in which uh, the equity principle needs to be translated into practice into the agreement uh, but finance is probably the most important um, of those um, ways to uh, operationalize um, equity. Um, there are different components um, to um, what needs to be in the finance uh, package to uh, COP26 um, I'll only have uh, the time to briefly touch upon them. Um, one of them is obviously what needs to be done through multilateral and bilateral development banks uh, to lower uh, the cost of capital, um, in particular in some uh, geographies in the uh, low income and most vulnerable uh, countries. Another component, which um, I know you will discuss in other uh, 
uh, panels um, and therefore I can be extremely brief is what needs to be done on private finance um, to make sure that not only uh, the principles and the criteria um, of the task force on carbon disclosure are progressively made mandatory um, in different jurisdictions, uh, but also that we go beyond disclosure um, and that investors actually have a plan for achieving the decarbonization of their investment uh, portfolios. Um, here too, the European Union made um, a very important uh, breakthrough with uh, the taxonomy, um, which uh, needs to be imitated uh, by others. Uh, but I will stress uh, two points. One is indeed, as Mauro said, the importance of uh, getting to an agreement on debt or rather more generally fiscal space for not only climate investments, by the way, but SDG sustainable development goals implementation more generally because the truth is that many countries, many countries are lacking such a fiscal space um, at the moment. So there needs to be as part of the G7, as part of the G20, as part of the Paris Club, but also um, involving China as a very significant debt holder, um, an agreement on those issues prior to COP26. Uh, there also needs to be um, an agreement, I think, um, on loss and damage um, and how to deal with uh, uh, the increasing um, impacts um, and costs um, of climate inaction or the lack of significant climate action um, uh, that have uh, rising costs um, in poor and vulnerable uh, countries. So I'll stop there. Um, I think we are in a situation where um, big power politics are definitely moving in the right direction with um, Europe, with China, with the US. Um, I also know uh, from uh, uh, real life experience of those negotiations that big power politics is a necessary condition for success at a COP, certainly not um, a sufficient uh, condition for that. Um, and this is therefore where I hope um, our friends in the British presidency will uh, concentrate most of their um, efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A particularly useful reminder, I think, of what it takes to succeed in big power politics, as you say, a starting point, essential starting point, but much beyond that. Um, I think also very interesting how you highlight the need to have both long term vision to set expectations, but also the follow through and the ratchet mechanism. Um, finance, of course, being an important category and also the role of non state actors, a, a topic close to my own heart. Um, I see a few questions in answer, are coming into the question and answer function. Please do continue to add them. Um, I'm sure we have lots to discuss in a moment. Before we do, I'm particularly excited to hear our final panelist um, offer her initial thoughts. Um, Ms. Heidi Hausla is Vice President of the European Parliament. And um, as an American, I'm, I'm particularly proud that we have yet another woman in the world today who can use the term Madam Vice President. But um, Madam Hausla, it's wonderful to have you leading the way. Um, she's her fifth term in the European Parliament, and she's also served as a member of parliament in her native Finland, where she also served as Minister for International Development and State Ownership Steering, and so has had a very real world practical look at these issues around the political economy of the green transition that we are thinking about today. Madam Vice President, your thoughts, please. Mm -hmm. th th thank you very much for inviting me, and I didn't think that there is indeed a very important uh, vice president in the United States today, uh, uh, Kamala Harris. But of course, she's a, she's a real breakthrough in, uh, in many ways. So um, I'm humbled by this invitation because um, I'm also a bit of a generalist, not so much uh, at the moment a climate politician. Uh, but of course, um, I would also say that uh, climate uh, and biodiversity, as we now understand, are very linked, and these are the most pressing issues of our days. And I also feel that we do have a window of opportunity, but it's just slightly open. Uh, and what needs to happen in the coming few years will define the future for of, of us all. So um, uh, I'm, I'm very much uh, fond of um, the assessment of Johan Rockström, director of the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research. Uh, he indeed illustrates uh, very clearly uh, that we are setting in motion a domino effect, and we have to understand that much better. Uh, he talks about five, 15 life-sustaining systems identified on Earth, and of these 15, three are on the verge of tipping, and nine have started to move. 
So once uh, a domino piece falls, it will inevitably tip over the next one. And once set in motion, emission reductions will no longer help. So indeed, the situation is, is, is very dire. And um, I'm asked to discuss a little bit what I think of the political process. Uh, is there a chance uh, that the political process and policymaking will be able to, to, to give an answer to, to these systemic changes? And I would like to say that I'm, I'm quite impressed by our Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen. She made a, an important speech, um, Union, State of the Union, uh, in September last year. And uh, she said, it is about um, much more than uh, much more than cutting emissions. Uh, our task is about making systemic modernization across our economy, society, and industry, and it is about building a stronger world to live in. So, systemic modernization. Uh, the question really is, how can we bring this uh, into into reality through the political process? My first observation here is that uh, we need finally and for good leave uh, the silos in policy making because um, we understand that there must be policy coherence and that many of our um, crises are very much interlinked and we cannot um, solve them one by one. Be it, and, and we need to address issues such as trade, finance, agriculture and any other field and we have to see the interlinkages. And this is a big challenge for the political process. But I can also say that um, what I see in the European Commission and maybe Mauro can can uh, uh, deny or confirm what I say, but um, I see for the first time a real uh, communication between different parts of the European Commission to, to try to, to break those silos and, and discuss openly and intensely how to solve these issues. Um, so indeed, uh, the Green Deal is an important breakthrough and it is being mandated to all the Commission uh, parts. So. Um, it is really the guiding principle in my view and the European Parliament has of, of, has of course been very very supportive of all this. So away from the silos and the second challenge for the policy process is in my view that needs to, there needs to be transparency in decision making and I couldn't overemphasize this too much because uh, we see that even if uh, access, public access to information is, is a legal principle in most of our jurisdictions, including in the EU, but we still see that many, many decisions are taken behind closed doors and in, in, in behind the scene, out of the, the daylight. And um, as long as this continues, we will continue to see that conflicts of interests play their role. Um, they hide uh, 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 agendas that are on the way of, of the political uh, transformation that we need to see. So um, I think we have to make sure that uh, we uh, improve our levels of, of transparency of the poli political uh, processes. Uh, a third observation is that what we see um, here and there, that um, there's quite a strong commitment uh, on the level of words to, to science, to, to scientific uh, knowledge, uh, and I think um, it's important that um, it will be somehow institutionalized as an, as the, as an advisor uh, in, in political process. And I believe that the, the Biden administration has shown a lot of willingness and a lot of determination to this direction. And I think this is good because we also have so much false information guiding policy process, to be honest. So um, then I would like to say that um, indeed, uh, there are some key uh, focal uh, sectors which need to, to have our uh, attention in uh, the um, uh, climate and biodiversity crisis. Um, fossil fuels, uh, this is, uh, let's say, very well understood, but however, uh, the progress is slow and it is uneven. Uh, we look at China. China is at the same time committing itself to, to carbon neutrality by 2060, and it is uh, on the way to build more, more uh, coal power. So um, how do we make sure that, um, that this really happens? Um, I think in Europe, uh, we have to take this just transition uh, very seriously, because what we see that um, uh, at local level, there are many struggles because people are losing their livelihoods, because we need to change our habits, we need to change our energy economies and so on. So um, indeed, um, 
this is a question that needs to be solved, not only at European and national level, but also at local level where people live their lives. And that's, of course, why cities and regions are an important uh, level to, to, to play. Mm. Then I, I mentioned land use change because um, I think the IPCC special report uh, in 2019 on climate change and land use was really a wake up call. And many of us started to, to ask the European Commission to translate these observations and, and uh, conclusions to the reform of the EU's common agriculture policy. We didn't see this happen. Even in the coming uh, the, the, uh, the few past months, we have seen that there are big contradictions on uh, how we should uh, address the issue of, of uh, land use, our food systems, and I would like to state that this is an area where we need, to, we need to focus a lot. There's also a lot of understanding of the detrimental um, uh, impact of industrial uh, meat production, of course, also to the animals themselves. Animal welfare, I think, should deserve to be raised much more on political agendas, but also with a view, of, with a view to energy consumption, land consumption, and uh, the uh, COVID crisis also has uh, uh, a link with industrial meat production. So uh, then trade. I think trade is one policy area which has quite a lot been uh, avoiding the sustainability radar, but things are changing. Uh, indeed, I, I haven't seen before that there would have been so much emphasis on uh, um, uh, the need to, to adapt uh, trade policies into sustainable uh, development and, and climate requirements. So I see that um, the EU Commission is struggling with this new challenge. Uh, we see that France and the Netherlands has urged um, a, a transformation of trade policies at the EU level, um, to making the WTO as an enabling platform for sustainability instead of, instead of being a, a hindrance. We need to look at our free trade agreements that they have the enforceable binding sustainable development chapters. And I'm confident that Focusing on these is useful and it will help. Now, um, then uh, the real issue, I think, with the national determined contributions and, and the whole uh, Paris process is that uh, it doesn't really take into account uh, carbon emissions embedded in trade. And this is a major factor. The EU has reduced domestic emissions by well over 20% below the 1990 level, but uh, emissions embedded in imports have kept growing, and now they are estimated to represent about 20% of EU's domestic emissions. So, um, as a consequence of this has been that the EU is now very, very engaged in shaping legislation, which makes it mandatory for corporate uh, players, companies, uh, to not only to disclose uh, what is hidden in their supply chains, but also uh, commit to, to eradicate uh, environmental damage, uh, climate risks and uh, human rights uh, violations from their supply chains. And I think here we will see a Brussels moment. I think the EU will become a global leader in corporate accountability. And uh, there, of course, the investor obligations are very important, which have to be mentioned both by, by Emmanuel and, and Mauro. Sustainable finance, it's a big potential that needs to, to, to develop and, and grow. So finally, um, um, of course, um, uh, now is the, the great day when the EU can start to look for new, new alliances. And this has to be put in place as soon as possible because Glasgow is a great opportunity, maybe the last to put things on the right track. But I would like to conclude by saying that indeed, I, I think, and this was also said by um, Mauro, I think uh, that if we don't get the grassroots on board, nothing will happen in the policy process. And here, I think we have to understand that um, we have an enormous mission for everybody here, saving the planet and helping the humanity on it, living on it. I, I, I was struck by a figure that I saw in a YouGov uh, survey. 37% of British adults find that their jobs are meaningless. I mean, this is, a, this is a tragedy, I would say. And why not take this very seriously and start to, to engage people in sustainable development in the fight against climate change? And this would be something that could give meaning to many people's lives if they would be a part of this process. 
And indeed, I believe that, uh, as I said, that the political process will not happen if people are not on board. By the way, I think it was Hartmut Meyer who said that grassroots need to be taken on board. So that's an essential part of the policy process. And I, I trust that you will discuss this deeply in the last part of, uh, of uh, the uh, seminar. So thank you very much.